First of all, I would like to express my gratitude and for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here today um, among my other um, um, presenter as well, um, especially to, to share with you all the work that I do in the community. And hopefully I'll be able to highlight some groundwork, ongoing groundwork that reflects some of the issues around energy and equity. I was very excited when um, AOD uh, sent over the invitation because when I think of energy, um, and equity, this was one of the most, um, you know, first initiatives that I started working on, um, even during my, 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 um, my school at Duke. I actually started a program while I was still at Duke and um, Actera, um, my formal organization, uh, took me on board and helped me uh, to implement by providing the resources um, and also the support because it was a very important um, project, which I will be talking about a lot more uh, down the my presentation. But climate resilient communities, um, this is a very new organization. We, as I mentioned before, we were part of Actera. CRC was a program of Actera since 2016, and 2019. Um, I'm sorry, um, and 2020. Last year, um, I've decided to transition out of Actera um, because of the direct need to work directly with frontline communities here in the Bay Area. So our mission and our whole goal is to, um, you know, work, serve the communities, especially frontline and underrepresented communities, by providing avenue to elevate their voices, which means working directly with them, supporting them, um, and planning with them to implement priority projects that are relevant and key to their resilience. Um, so let me move on to my next slide. Um, so these are our three core programs at CRC. Um, one, we have community-based adaptation program. This, pro this program works directly, as I said, correct directly with communities um, in regards to um, climate adaptation planning. As you may know, um, here in the Bay Area, we do have communities that are under-resourced. Um, there are a lot of equity issues, environmental justice issues. Um, but the other key um, barriers that I found while working here um, even on the projects is the many barriers that these communities um, face. So for example, not only they don't have access to services, services that are developed for them because of the way the information is communicated. Not only that, um, most of the communities of color, low income families work five jobs or four and don't have the time to research or even don't have the capacity to understand. Most of the resources and information are communicated in a very um, thick, or what would say um, the language use, um, it's very technical for them to understand. And one of the things that we advocate for, information that are going out to what? the communities have to be um, at least uh, in a level of a, a fifth grade, a fifth grade reader. Um, the other, so under the community-based adaptation, we manage or coordinate a climate change community team in Ispawato, a team that CRC helped create and for that team to bring together community leaders, city managers and staff, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations to help coordinate climate change work, coordinate, advocate, and even build capacity of the community around climate change. Our other programs include Baylands and Coastal Restoration Project. This is a very new project we see receive funding for, and we're gonna start that. But the whole goal for that project, not only restoring nature and um, bringing nature back or nature as an adaptation measure, we're also going to create opportunities and access for the community to enjoy the, um, you know, the coolie landing area or the open space that they have in the community. We work in East Palo Alto, Bow Haven, and Menlo Park. 
Bellhaven and No Fair Oaks. And some of our projects, we also coordinate the Climate Ready No Fair Oaks team. Now we also have the Climate Action Education Program. Um, this is where all our education um, programs are developed for frontline community youth use. A lot of these programs offers, um, we offer um, um, on hand or we offer experience. Um, when we are talking about climate change and sea level rise, we offer opportunities where we take them out to the bay um, and provide that firsthand experience, even building leadership around um, advocating for these issues. And then lastly, this the, the one of our main program, and like I said, this is the first program that I worked on. Um, it used to be called Green at Home to Grid Ready, but it is now called Resilient Homes because we had to do some rebranding around this program because it was formerly under Ectera and Green at Home is an Ectera um, program. So anyway, under the energy efficiency or the Resilient Home program, this program was developed is to help low income families access free solar. We actually built this program just to work with families to um, do an energy audit, help them to access um, programs like the CARE, the FERA, um, PG&E, um, you know, um, programs that help low income families reduce cost of their energy use. Um, we partner up with um, grid alternatives that provides free solars for low income families. And so since the beginning of the program, we kind of like develop it um, and expand it because most of the families that we work with in East Palo Alto and Valhaven, many of the homes I walk in, if you're trying to do an energy audit, it, it doesn't really make sense because the home is old, most of the homes are like were built like in the 1950s and 60s. Most of the homes don't have air conditions. Most of the homes have broken windows, broken doors. And if you're also trying to help them access free solar, the roof is too old or the roof has many leaks. And so it's not safe for families to access these services. So the program became more of um, a program that helps uh, low income families access uh, services and programs that offers um, that offers services that improve the living environment, but at the same time, um, help reduce their energy use. So this is um, again, um, um, more details about the Resilient Homes Program. It's really in home energy equity in low income communities. So we support a lot of low income families improve quality of life for seniors. Many of the homeowners in communities like East Palo Alto and Bell Haven are owned by seniors, which have bought these homes 50 years ago. So they are house rich, but they are living off of fixed income. So they never have enough savings to, um, you know, replace the broken window or put a new energy efficiency refrigerator in the home. So what CRC does under this program, we provide case management, which means we help the homeowner apply for the services. So providing access to the services. We also provide um, trainings and workshops in the communities, working with community-based organizations. And we even bring in um, community organizations like um, Habitat for Humanity, Rebuilding Together, Al Concilio, who offers mostly free services to these families. So up to now, um, we didn't do a lot of these homes, uh, this kind of, the, we didn't do a lot of um, home repairs or um, solar installation in the past year during COVID, but before COVID, we served more than 200 homes. Um, and some of our families have received, um, like one house will receive um, a new roof from Habitat, a solar panels from Grid Alternatives, a furnace from another organizations. And that's how we actually bringing all these services to the community. So we really depend on the partnerships that we have built. 
not only with the community, but also with the partner organizations that provide the services. Many of the families who have received these services pay very little money um, for everything that they received under our program. Um, the reason why I have this map up here is just to um, share with some of you that a lot of the policy, existing policies that we have around this programming, um, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of help and support available for low income families around energy, but the problem is the access to these services. And if you can see, there are a lot of policies um, in place as well to support um, low income or frontline community. So, you know, with the SB 535, the disadvantaged communities, a lot of funding is um, mainstream into serving um, priority communities that are highly vulnerable to climate change, but also have other disadvantaged things like high um, pollution, um, even high poverty rates. And this is one of the tools that is used by um, um, that is used by um, in here in California um, to identify these communities. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you all today is because sometimes the policies are in place are not fair. Um, for example, the cap and trade, which you see here, East Palo Alto does fit um, as a low as a disadvantaged community, but it doesn't cover the whole city of East Palo Alto. So I've had families in East Palo Alto who qualified for, you know, with the income, they qualify for the free solar program that is provided by Grid Alternatives. But unfortunately, the home is not within the red area of East Palo Alto. So it kind of like um, creates um, some unfairness as well because there are families who really need the services but cannot because they are not in the DAC area. Sometimes some of the eligibility criteria that are um, offered with these services, like the income is very low for families to qualify. So if you look at the Light Heat program, and this is the low income home energy assistance program, a family of four, if you're making $56,103, you qualify for this service. If you make 56,104, you automatically not qualified. Um, and so we always feel like these incomes are low and these are even, these incomes are before taxes. Um, so a lot of families who need the kind of service and help to improve the energy efficiency in their home, access free solars may not qualify because of the policies that are in place or the criteria for eligibility to access these services. Um, these are some of the success stories uh, from the work that we've done. These are two different um, homeowners, both ladies. Uh, we've helped them, both of them, Amelia on the left. She received, um, she received services from Habitat for Humanity. Uh, her story, her mom passed away, only her, she's, a caregiver living off of a caregiver salary and she was not able to fix or even repair her home. So we went in and helped her and eventually she received solar after um, repairments on her roof by Habitat for Humanity. Again, you see that partnership, Habitat for Humanity and Grid Alternatives, two different organizations working in the community to serve um, you know, a homeowner like Amelia. Same story with Alvarez to the right. Her husband passed away um, suddenly. She had a lot of issues, needed help with her home. Um, and so we also went in, helped her um, get help from Habitat for Humanity. She received new windows, new flooring, um, and repairment of her roof. And then eventually, um, Grid Alternatives went in and helped her with the solar installation. Both families are now benefiting from solar systems that help save 90% of their um, of their PG and E bill. And of course, education and awareness is another key component to the work that we do. So we do work with them and help them to conserve energy within the home. 
Um, lastly, I want to show um, a couple of things that we also do on the ground around energy. Like I said, the communities um, need the support and the services. Unfortunately, the information does not get to them easily. So we create events in the community, bringing organizations to the homeowners or to the community members. So we have revitalization events is one of our key projects that we do. Um, this was our last one in 2019. We couldn't do one last year. It always, ha always happens at the end of the year. Um, we started doing this since 2016. We always change our community centers to host these community revitalization events. And during the revitalization events, we always have projects um, planned around it. Like on the same day, we have a solar training event. We would have a solar installation on one of the homes in East Palo Alto, or um, we will have a tree planting, um, community tree planting event also um, happening the same time. So it's creating um, opportunity for the community to come together, learn about the different organizations and services, and even um, the organizations out there to help them apply on that day. So a lot of families have received services through um, this kind of events. And the organization and partners have also noticed a, a big um, um, increase in, in, in um, people applying for their services. This is another photo I wanted to share what our event looks like in the community. I really miss this because it's been a year we haven't been out doing much. Um, and so I want to finish off with this uh, slide about resilience and equity. Again, CRC, we work with community leaders. Uh, we work alongside them. A lot of our programming is designed to address community priorities because we believe in um, solutions that are generated for and by the community. So we are very flexible in that way. We also believe that community have a lot of strength, um, their capacity to network. Resiliency means um, very strong networking and we have seen that in the communities. That's why they are resilient. So we also wanna go in and help build that up and elevate the existing capacity they have. Education and awareness is a action that the community always asks us to, to do because a lot of these issues we work around like energy, climate change, sea level rise, these are all new things to them, even though they, their lived experiences, it's not the same, but we help connect those issues to, um, to the level that the community understands and uh, build that connections. And one last thing, um, stronger partnerships. This is very true um, for us who are working in this field. We always need to um, help each organization and hopefully I am able, to, I was able to illustrate that with my past slides, how we are able to implement and support the community through partnerships, um, helping one another um, and, and that's why I'm here again today is to share that story because, you, you know, with climate change, not one organization can deal with it. Um, everyone has to work together to, to build uh, a regional resiliency for, for our area and for the people that are highly vulnerable. So thank you again for, uh, for my time and I'm looking forward to um, answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Violet. That was a really great presentation. Um, as Aoade mentioned in the chat, um, feel free to drop your questions in there. Um, we're gonna save them till the end after Leslie's presentation. Um, and then hopefully we can have a really sort of engaged audience discussion as well. So welcome, Leslie. Um, let me go ahead and share your presentation. There you go. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, Bianca and Ayoade, for the invitation. Um, nice to be here with you all. Uh, and thank you for helping me at the last minute with my slides and technical difficulties there. Um, yeah, as Bianca mentioned, I'm Leslie Aguayo. I'm a program manager at the Green Lining Institute. We're located in Oakland, California. Um, we're a racial equity organization, and I'm excited to share with you all um, why we need to center race to advance climate and transportation equity. Um, so just a little bit of background on my organization. Uh, so for 27 years, the Green Lining Institute has set out to bring economic opportunities to low-income communities of color through research, policy advocacy, and leadership development. Um, and so for this presentation today, I'm going to be talking very explicitly about race. Um, and if I do this right, and if we all do this right, um, it might make some folks uncomfortable, and that's totally okay, right? Being part, being uncomfortable is a necessary part of the process um, towards the collective work um, of advancing justice and sustainability. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So I just want to go ahead and start here by sharing the definition of equity that Greenlining holds. Um, so equity is transforming the behaviors, institutions, and systems that disproportionately harm people of color. Equity means increasing access to power, redistributing and providing additional resources, and eliminating the barriers to opportunity in order to empower low-income communities of color to thrive and reach their full potential. And to be clear, equity is not the same thing as equality. Equality is the assumption that the playing field is level, whereas equity acknowledges that people are starting from very different places because of systemic injustices um, like redlining. Um, next slide. Um, so, oh, there's actually, go ahead and click it three times, Bianca, please. So in order to share why race matters in policy and why we must lead with racial equity, uh, I'm going to tell three stories. Um, so first, I'm going to tell the story of the past and recount the history of race in America and how it relates to our built environment and economy. Then I'll tell the story of today and how the past currently manifests in injustices for people of color still. Uh, and finally, I'll tell the story of tomorrow and how we can all work together collectively to build a society that is just and healthy for everyone. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the story of the past. Um, as many of you may um, be familiar with this history, um, in the 1930s, in the middle of the Great Depression, many families were struggling to make ends meet and were defaulting on their mortgages. So in response, the federal housing agencies began issuing government-backed mortgages to help post-war families build wealth through the Depression. However, not all families received the same help. Many historians credit this policy to helping families rebuild their wealth during uh, their lives during this crisis. Um, but there's also a really shameful side to this story that's not often talked about, right? It's one rooted in racism. And basically it instills that our government and the real estate industry is directly responsible for um, this past. Uh, next slide. So this is an audit from surveyors hired by the city of Oakland in 1937. Um, as you can see in the box in red, it includes pretty offensive language and explicitly names Black and Asian folks as a detrimental influence on the community um, and the reason for redlining. To further illustrate how egregious this policy was, the Federal Housing Administration had a manual which said that incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. And for good measure, this manual also recommended using highways as a good way to separate black neighborhoods from white ones. So for all intents and purposes, this was state-sponsored systems of segregation. Um, next slide. And so redlining was instituted all over the country. As we know, home ownership is the primary way that families build intergenerational wealth and people of color were effectively locked out of this opportunity. And I wanna be clear here that redlining still exists today. It's just in much more subtle ways, right? 
black home buyers are twice as likely to be turned down for a loan than white home buyers, for example. And redlining didn't just impact home ownership. It also combined with zoning and disenfranchisement and disinvestment, it concentrated pollution in polluting industries and highways in these neighborhoods. So while redlining was technically outlawed decades ago, this lack of investment is still lingering today. Next slide. So another part of this story of the past is also the story of highways and the systematic redesign of our cities for the, for the car, for the automobile. Highways were constructed, uh, constructed often directly through communities of color, and this destroyed local neighborhood economies and locked in air pollution. These highways enabled white flight from cities to suburbs, which were often designated as white only neighborhoods. And as a result, this shifted investments in commercial development, corporate headquarters and other businesses into, um, from cities and into, into wealthier and whiter suburbs. Today, we actually see the inverse of white flight, right? taking place as young, educated, and upwardly mobile folks move into once undesirable urban cores and displace long-term residents of color. So redlining and highways were born from America's long legacy of racist public policies, and today subversive versions of redlining continue taking a toll on people of color. Additionally, historically in the US, low income individuals and folks of color have been over policed and hyper surveilled with transportation violations serving as one of the pretenses for disparate citations. Um, and often those citations as we've seen lead to abuse of power, criminalization and death um, as was in the most recent case with George Floyd's murder who, uh, whose murder was a year ago today. Next slide. Um, and then also go ahead and click through these. So since the founding of this country, um, the genocide of native people to slavery, to Jim Crow laws, to the Chinese Exclusion Act, to Japanese internment and to the subsequent Black Lives Matter movements of today, race has always determined the winners and losers in America. The private sector and the public sector work hand in hand to build these structures of inequality. And over time, this accumulates and it compounds. So let's remember that this history was not created by just a few bad actors. These were all deliberate public policy decisions that were carried out by federal, state, and local governments. Government created these injustices, and so government must also play a role in solving them. So the story of the past, is, it's heavy and it hits hard. And I'm showing you these photos because we always have to keep this legacy in mind. Because while I wish that I could say racial injustice was a thing of the past, we all know it's not. So our country has never fully confronted our legacy of racial injustice in a meaningful way. Next slide. And so now I wanna talk about the story of today. If we take a look at the current COVID-19 pandemics and we start to see that it's pulling back the curtains on America's deeply rooted inequities. These maps show the environmental impacts of um, red, as a result of redlining as well as COVID-19 impacts. So the first one shows us the redlining map and there are lots of similarities between the first map and continual environmental um, pollutants in the second map, and then COVID-19 rates as well in the last one. Um, and as we know, people of color are the most impacted um, with, yes, I can go ahead and share these slides. Um, people of color are the most impacted um, with Latinx communities seeing some of the highest numbers of COVID-19 cases and African Americans making up the highest mortality rates. The economic impact associated with COVID is similarly impacting black and brown communities most severely. And I wanna stress that COVID-19 and racism are global pandemics with very real public health consequences. So we do this work because communities of color across the country continue to be harmed by racial disparities that are largely a result of policymaking. Next slide. 
So it's no surprise that COVID cases are disproportionately concentrated in these communities of color. In this graph, you see that Latinx and Black communities continue, contain a higher percentage of cases compared to the share of the population. And this is Alameda County, but it is representative of the US overall. Next slide. And studies have also shown that women make up a majority of essential workers, unpaid caregivers, and domestic laborers, indicating that they are hardest hit by COVID-19, harder hit than their male counterparts. Um, in general, Black, Latinx, and Native communities have higher rates of pre-existing conditions, which lead to greater risks of COVID. And um, while Asian American communities are experiencing increasing rates of xenophobia as well, add to that the compounding risks women carry, and we can determine that women of color are carrying and bearing the brunt of this pandemic. Next slide. So this is a graph from a study on California's, California's cap and trade program. It shows that the biggest two indicators of people that live near polluting factories are class and race. In fact, race is the biggest predictor of living near a polluting facility in California. It has now been proven that it is also true for the rest of the country. If you are a poor person of color, you're almost guaranteed to live near facilities that have been proven to be detrimental to human life. And again, this didn't just happen. By design, people in power decided which communities could be sacrificed so that others could benefit. Next slide. And power plays a really big role here. In the story of today, a large contributor to why marginalized people are still struggling is a result of who is at the decision-making table. So on the left, uh, the graphic shows that the racial makeup of the top transportation decision makers in the US does not accurately represent the demographic of the communities they are making decision for on the right. And these numbers are a few years old, but we know that the proportion of people of color is growing, yet the diversity of decision makers is not increasing at the same rate. So when we talk about equity, we also have to talk about representation just imagine how differently our society would look if women and people of color and everyone in between were accurately represented in these decision-making spaces. Next slide. So now I wanna talk about the story of tomorrow. I'm sure many of you have seen the consequences of climate change ravaging, ravaging our country. Um, I, for one, am located in Berkeley, California, and I'm sure there's a handful of you all who are also in Northern California. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, right, I was in, we were all in the front row of California's forest fires, um, and summer 2020 was extremely difficult. Many people experienced not only the loss of life, but the loss of their homes and safety, and have also been experiencing climate grief which is a very real psychological response through anxiety and depression due to the impacts of climate destruction. So we can talk about mitigating climate change, but regardless of how much we lessen our greenhouse gas emissions, the climate is still going to change and will continue to impact some communities more than others. The reason we have inequities in climate impacts is because of racist policies, like I mentioned before, and communities of color, specifically black and brown neighborhoods have been and continue to be isolated into undesirable geographic areas, which makes them more susceptible to climate change impacts. And not only are they more geographically vulnerable, they often lack reliable transportation op options in the event of an emergency. And because of a lack of intergenerational wealth, these frontline communities will also have a much more difficult time rebuilding their lives after natural disasters. Next slide. And so in response to these current and impending environmental issues, uh, the Green Lining Institute's climate equity team is made up of a few topic areas um, where we seek to uh, uh, mitigate some of these impacts. So, as we've seen, you know, the conversation, the times are changing and cities are actually raising the bar on equity and business as usual is not gonna cut it anymore. So we need to really set a high standard for how climate investments and climate policy will actually benefit communities. And so because 
equity as a term has been becoming mainstream, there is a risk that it can turn into an empty promise, which is what we call equity washing, if there's no strategy behind the promise to achieve the outcome. Next slide. And so in order to actualize equity from this nebulous, ambiguous thing to actionable outcomes, it's important to follow consistent steps. And so um, at the Green Lining Institute, we developed this making equity real framework. It was developed from one of my colleagues in climate um, and um, resiliency uh, reports. And so we hold that, you know, you can operationalize equity through four steps if you get them right. The first is making sure that equity is in your goals and your mission and your values. The second is that there's an equitable process. Thirdly, there's equity in implementation. And lastly, that you measure for equity to see if you actually met those goals set in number one. Next slide. And so I just wanna conclude on a, on a note here that you know poor communities of color continue to suffer most from the legacy of segregation and racially motivated policies. And they've led to horrible exposure to pollution and toxins. And so as we all collectively navigate these really unprecedented times that have brought racial inequities to a head, it's really important that we center race to advance environmental equity, right? For the protection and investment of the communities that are most burdened. And they're burdened by compounding effects of COVID-19, climate change, and racial inequities. And so just wanna leave you all with, with that sentiment that we really need to focus racial equity at the center of everything we do. Uh, thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you Great. so much, Leslie. That was fantastic. Um, I am gonna pass it off to Adam and Sky, our moderators, and I believe we can promote some uh, critical dialogue. Um, so Adam, over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, um, Violet and Leslie. This was just really phenomenal. Um, and it's great to hear from you both. Um, so now we have some time for Q&A. So if folks have questions, um, we welcome um, folks to either, you know, raise your hand um, and we can call on you to ask your question or put them in the chat and we can um, read them aloud. Um, and we're really just excited to open up a larger dialogue around this. Um, and so I can get us started with the first question, which is, um, could you each speak about some formative experiences that have influenced you on your career path um, and what kind of brought you into the work in the space that you are now working on today? Let me go first, give Leslie some time to rest her voice <laughs> from uh, all that talking and presentation. Um, that, thank you very much, Adam, for the question. I think for me, um, a formative experience, you know, coming from the islands, my lived experience before coming here, I was already working on climate change um, and sea level rise program, advocating for small island states. I was already working with um, islands that were faced with, um, you know, going underwater um, governments like Tuvalu and Kiribati. Um, for me to learn about their, um, you know, the risk to their people and their community, the threat of losing a whole country, culture, um, something that really resonates with me. And so, because of that, you know, my whole career um, and my whole work around climate change has always been advocating for um, the voiceless um, wherever I am. And I think coming back to now, I'm, I am surely doing the same thing. I'm, I'm working with frontline communities, um, communities of color, um, communities that are disadvantaged and are highly vulnerable to climate change and sea level rise because now, um, you know, we all, we've already seen the, the impacts of wildfire. It's becoming a, a, normal, um, a normal experience for us. And just by being in the community on the ground, 
walking inside people's homes, uh, people who don't have the resources, it really opens your eyes like the vulnerability that they face because of their adaptive capacity to adapt. It's very low. So I think for me, my fight is always for those people that are highly vulnerable and have less resources and understanding and awareness to respond and be resilient to the impacts of climate change. Great, thank you so much, Violet. Should I answer the same question? Yeah, that'd be, for, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I, I would say that I've had a, a handful of formative experiences. Um, I am originally from LA, from Los Angeles, and um, we, I grew up moving around a couple of times, but you know, there was a, a point where I got a scholarship to this like fancy school on the west side of Los Angeles. So I was living in Inglewood at the time with my family and got an opportunity to go to get a better education. And so that commute was from Inglewood, which is near LAX airport, if folks are familiar with the geography. And I would commute to um, Topanga Canyon slash Cal Calabasas area. And that commute was only about 40 minutes, which wasn't too bad. Um, and then we moved to Palmdale, which is in the outskirts LA County area. And that's about 60 miles out of the way. So formatively, you know, at a young age, didn't understand why I had to go to a completely different part of town for a better education um, and didn't have the language to express that. And also like didn't know why I was the only Latina in an entire like grade. Um, and then the 2008 recession hit and none of my classmates talked about it. We weren't, it wasn't talked about in the classroom or among kids, right? It just almost seemed like there was a bubble and everyone that I went to school with um, was just wasn't hit by the 2008 recession. And meanwhile, everyone in the community that I came from was, there was a foreclosure crisis, folks were losing their jobs. Like it was, you know, for everyone that remembers that time, it was a really difficult time. And our family got hit with the foreclosure crisis. And from then on, I really like went on this path of understanding why. And I finally got to college and took an urban studies class and learned about, you know, what I just mentioned in my presentation, which was redlining and blockbusting and restrictive covenants. And it gave me this, like, the language and the sense of validation that it's not an individual burden. It's not because you can't pull yourself up from your bootstraps. It's not because, you know, you aren't working hard enough. It's really just the system is rigged. Um, and I think from there on, it just kind of led me down to take more planning classes and eventually um, studying uh, affordable housing development and now transportation. Um, so I would say the formidable, formidable experiences were pretty personal, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Leslie. Very inspiring. Um, I'll pass it to Sky um, to ask our next question. Yeah, so, you know, it can obviously be difficult to be constantly dealing with heavy issues like injustice and equity. So how do you guys stay energized in your work and practice self-care? Yeah, I think for me, again, um, I would say the, the experience of working with families. Um, currently, I'm working with two elderly homeowners. One lady, she lives in Belhaven of Menlo Park. It's been three years. She didn't have a furnace. And this is an elderly grandmother who lives with her unemployed daughter and a granddaughter. And um, depending on the programs that we offer, we will be able to provide her a furnace for the first time in three years. Um, been working as well with another homeowner. Um, her mom left her the house. She's on dialysis. When I went in for the first time about two years ago to do an energy audit and an assessment, I couldn't breathe in that home. Um, the home was very toxic to me because um, it's an old house. Um, she looks like she was on you know, dialysis for a while. She's not able to do any maintenance or any improvements. 
Habitat for Humanity went in, um, helped her. It's almost a brand new house now. And she is able to enjoy all the benefits from this program. And her house is one of the, the biggest um, projects that we've done so far in East Palo Alto. Cost almost 25,000 to repair that home. So imagine the, how bad the house was. But you know, the, that's the, the benefits. Um, the service that we offer, um, I think, the, I think the um, the gratitude that we get from homeowners and and the families that are not able to afford really keeps me going and and doing this work that I do. Um. Yeah, self care is a is a hard one to answer. Um. I think you know everyone has their own form of, of self-care. Um, I think, let's see, I mean, this year has been hard, as I'm sure all of you are, are aware and have experienced it. So I think it's really just about um, being able to show up in the space from a place of um, like a full cup, you know, because um, otherwise I have started to notice you know, when I feel overworked, even if the work itself is for, you know, a good cause and a good purpose. And I feel like I have, I have purpose and I contribute to the field. Um, this space is also not diverse, right? And so being a, one of the few women in the electric vehicle spaces, be, being a woman of color, um, it can be really intimidating to even speak up. And so it almost feels like just the mental preparation for getting to a meeting and then feeling self-conscious about what I'm saying. And then in the aftermath, having like an anxiety hangover of like, did I say the right things? Are they going to take me seriously? All of that is energy expended that I'm sure my white male counterparts do not have to expend. And that's not quantifiable labor. Like I don't get paid extra because I went through that whole like emotional labor thing. So I think it's just like being aware of that one and two doing things like understanding how much energy I have left so that there are times where I'm just like I'm gonna turn my camera off I will show up I will say something maybe my commentary will actually be written and it won't be verbal um, and just kind of keeping a really tuned in way of knowing when you're tapped out um, and that, I guess that applies to pretty much anything really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Leslie and Violet. And Adam, back to you. Yeah, so our next question was um, around community engagement. Um, could you both talk a little bit about, a little bit more about your approach to a community engagement um, and how this has changed over time? Um, and I know you both also touched on this, but also in context with the pandemic, how, how has this evolved? And, what sort of strategies have you um, had to adapt with um, with these changes? Yeah. Um, so for for my programs, uh, it has changed a lot. As I said, well, back in 2016, when I first started off in in East Palo Alto with the Green at Home to Grid Ready project, um, it's me going into a whole new community a community of color, a community who has a history of um, not trusting outsiders. Um, and the service that I was offering as well makes it really hard for me was because the program that I was promoting is energy audit, opportunity for a free solar um, on your roof if you're a homeowner and qualified. And so a lot of people were like, really didn't trust that that was a program. like. They always ask me, I'm sure there's a catch, right? Nothing is for free in this world. Um, but, you know, what I learned fast was that, you know, I have to um, walk alongside community leaders that the community trust. So immediately I connected with some key community leaders in East Palo Alto, people like Mama D, um, Sharifa Wilson, former mayor of East Palo Alto. Um, even Pastor Father Goody, who the whole Catholic community trusts. So I started talking and connecting and working with them to reach the community. At the same time, I was walking the street, knocking on doors, leaving flyers, um, start a conversation with a homeowner that's there watering her plants. 
um, if like I made, you know, if I was walking at the right time. But overall, I think what really changed was the outcome of the work that we were doing because we were not only preaching or sharing the information, um, families started getting free solar. And so then myself and uh, my partner, um, who is from Great Alternatives, we started hosting events where we would invite families who have received the services to be our advocate. Um, we even, and that's why we had that idea of um, creating um, revitalization events around installation so that we can invite the neighborhood to see for themselves what we are doing on the ground. And even um, I think having them seeing this partnership grow over time, it also really helped. So now, um, even during COVID, I'm not doing any outreaching because of COVID, but people are calling my phone. Like I have five families on my list, new families. They call last week because the people that we've helped have shared the word. Um, so now those people are telling them, yeah, call Violet. And then I get a call Violet, you know, um, can you help us? We, we want to get, you know, we want to get the solar. We've heard about it. How can we access that services? And then, of course, I will just have to send an email to my partner organization, giving them the contact and the name um, of the people who are interested. And if I have to come back in to help with the application, then CRC will be there to support the community. So for us now, things are getting easier with our outreach. Um, I think the challenge now is that we're expanding to new communities. Um, we are rebranding and we hope to expand our service to No Fair Oaks, another new um, community that we just started serving last year. Um, and I have a great um, graduate um, from Stanford who's helping me with the rebranding, Valeria Recon, um, who so far has done a lot of work um, and the work that she's doing now will help CRC to expand our reach. Oh, Adam, I know we're at time. Do we have time for me to answer or would you like to wrap it up? Yeah, well, um, we'd love to hear from you too, Leslie, if you have like just a few final words for us as we close out. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that for me what's changed um during the pandemic it's so uh, in comparison to to violet i don't have the like on the ground on the ground boots on the ground community organizing um experience um we call ourselves like a grass top organization which means we work at like with policy makers um and one thing that i've definitely seen a lot more during the pandemic is folks throwing around the word equity, right? Like just, it seems like every RFP, RFQ bidding process, like or just they have to have some kind of equity component for the money to be awarded or for the funding to go through, which is great. And also it can lead to this, you know, whole equity washing thing where people just kind of say, we held a community meeting, check the box, right? But that community meeting was in the middle of the day. They didn't offer child care. They didn't compensate any of the community members. They didn't translate any of the material to languages that were needed to be translated to. And so they're checking these boxes off, but not actually doing the work. And I think that during the pandemic, we've seen a rise again of this, of this equity term, um, but we've also seen a big influx of money, right? Like the state, um, uh, budget actually has a $75 million billion surplus. And it's how did we get that money if we're in the middle of a pandemic? And it's mainly because of the folks that are in the top 10, 1% of the economy in California, it's all income tax. So it's all the foot, like the inequities of having certain people benefit from a pandemic and profit from it were then taxed, and that taxing increased the budget surplus for the state which, you know, I can go down that rabbit hole, but now what do we do with this money? And it means that we have to actually codify equity and hold people accountable to those standards and make sure that if we're saying, all right, you got like X billion dollars to invest in housing or in transportation or wherever it might be, 
at least, at least for advocating for 50%, so at least half of that money has to be in disadvantaged communities and in low income communities. And you have to look at the census tracts, you have to make sure it's accessible. Otherwise, we're just going to repeat these inequities. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I would just leave with accountability, I think, is something that I'm really trying to push for. And figure out how to do better, um, because it's great that we're shifting the conversation, but we really need to make sure that people are walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Great, thank you so much, Leslie. Um, it's been great hearing from you both. Um, you both have such a wealth of knowledge and we're super grateful for your time. Um, and I will pass it back to Bianca and Ayoade to close us out. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Adam and Sky, for those awesome questions. Um, and echoing a huge thanks again to our panelists, uh, Leslie and Violet, for sharing their time with us today. Um, we did have a couple questions come through, and acknowledging the time, I'll go ahead and share those over email, and we'll we'll stay corresponding there. But um, on that note, just to close, um, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you all for coming and for joining us. Please do stay in touch. Um, I'll put in a quick plug for for both my and Bianca's programs um, uh, and, and you know some of the background behind our, our co-hosting today is um, really wanting to connect students um, to work that is happening in the community, um, uh, work that uh, is happening uh, you know right next door to our institution um, that is that is deeply engaged um, with with the community, the very necessary community aspects of, of, of equity and justice um, in, in the pursuit of um, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. And, and these are just two examples um, that, that um, Leslie and Violet have so generously shared with us today. Um, so please feel free uh, again to stay in touch um, and, and to let us know um, how you like today. Um, and I wanna wish you all the, the very best. I've been wrapping up a, a difficult time of the quarter and to thank you again for your time and for joining us.